Next on MLR Weekly, the new expansion, Miami Sharks CEO Mark Winokur. The best recap in Major League Rugby. MLR headlines and news with John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning. And previews and predictions from Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. Rugby Wrap-Ups MLR Weekly brought to you by Sheehy Auto Stores. It's easy at Sheehy. The Pig & Whistle, New York City. The world's best rugby pub. And... Lean and limber, stretching your way to a healthier lifestyle. Presented by Rugby Wrap Up, Matt McCarthy in New York City. Thank you for joining us. We've got a very cool show for you this week. We've got Mr. Mark Winokur, the CEO of the new Miami Sharks. You might recognize his name. He was formerly with the Toronto Arrows. We also have Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News with previews and predictions and opinions. And we have the best recap in Major League Rugby brought to you by Rugby Now. But before we get to any of that, we have Rugby Morning's Coffee Break with MLR News and Headlines by John Fitzpatrick. But John, I got to ask you, uh, while I welcome you in simultaneously, what, what's with the outfit? Well, this show could use a little touch of professionalism in class, so I figured I'd bring it today. Okay, I guess uh, your version of class means wearing a crappy tie. Speaking of crappy ties, Matt, there's no way you know the answer to this question. There have been 398 regular season games played in MLR history. How many have ended in a draw? Well, I don't know if this is a trick question because there were two half games. So does that come out of the 398? Does it make it 396? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that they're counting those as full games. So if that's the case, then it would be six ties. Yeah, McCarthy, you are good. I am. Next. So the San Diego Legion have extended their win streak to nine games. One off the mark set by the New England Free Jacks last season. San Diego was on a bye this round and then returned to action against New York. Matt, do you think San Diego can get to 10? I do. I do. I'm just wondering at a certain point if they're going to consider that streak important or resting players as they move on. Next! Shout out to Utah Warriors scrum half Connor McLeod. He scored three tries in 13 minutes. I got another question for you, Matt. There's no way you get this. So McLeod scored three tries in 13 minutes, the second fastest three try span in MLR history. No way, McCarthy. You know who scored three tries in nine minutes back in 2021. Well, it have to be a guy right in the middle of the action, and Malcolm in the middle would be my choice. Not Peter, James. Oh, McCarthy, you're good. You're I good. Am, I am very good. I am very good. Next! The Dallas Jackals announced an extension with Lock Sam Dalla. Dalla, who was the first overall pick in the 2023 MLR draft. Got a holla for Gala. <laughs> Yes, you do. He's in the running for MLR Rookie of the Year. Do you think he'll win it? Is there anyone else in that conversation? Well, the other guy in the conversation is Colin Gross of D.C., the West Point grad. Both have been on the show this year. Uh, it's going to be tight. Either one of them are deserving. Next! Matt, that's all I got. I just have one final question for you. How's your fantasy Rutgers team doing? We're up against it. And again, as I've said from the preseason on, it's just an honor and a privilege to be associated with the group that we are with the Fantasy Ruckers. We're not worthy to be in it, and we're just hoping to to uh, add some flavor to the league. Thank you. Next! Matt, that's all I got. Hey, try and dress up next time. You look like a schlub. All right. Thanks again to John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning. And ladies and gentlemen, before we move forward with the rest of our show, we have to look backward. That's right. Look back in time with Major League Rugby's best recap. And what better way to do that than with Rugby Now's recap right now. It was Friday Night Lights in Ontario, Canada, as the Arrows targeted a victory versus Atlanta. And the visitors from Georgia, the state, not the country, showed no ill effects from traveling north of the border and bolted to a significant lead early. 
Toronto dropped the gloves, however, and fought back, but were still trailing 31 to 17 as Atlanta made substitutions. Ross Brody came off the bench for Toronto and changed the complexion of the game. Toronto roared back after being dead in the water twice and pulled out a 34-34 tie, exciting their faithful fans and devastating those of rugby ATL. In Dallas, in the place that Nolan Ryan used to pitch, the Jackals once again took a bite out of their opponents, but they needed another mouthful as the Utah Warriors were able to hold on in an exciting rugby match. Connor McLeod of Utah thrilled Warriors Nation back home in the mountains by scoring a hat trick in about 14 minutes. Nine tries were scored by the teams who were virtually statistically even throughout. Utah gets a key victory in the Western Conference race 36 to 26 as Rura and Gomez Barra continue to excel for Dallas. Down at the gold mine in New Orleans, the San Diego Legion had their winning streak on the line. Indeed, this would be no big easy win for the team from Southern California. In a tense first quarter, neither team was able to score, but Tion, show me the loots, got a lucky hop and scored the game's first try 24 minutes into the match. The hometown gold would counter punch with a try of their own and kept it close as the Legion took two yellow cards before pulling away in the match's final minutes. 26-12 was the score, and Nola now needs help to make the postseason. In Space City at the Cats Meow, trademark. The game of the week between the hometown Sabre Cats and division rival Seattle Seawolves was all Cats early. But a second half try by USA Rugby legend Samu Manoa, basically playing on one leg, got the visitors back in the match. And the Sabre Cats look declawed in an anything but perfect second half. The Seawolves continued to make a splash and serve the league notice, scoring 31 unanswered points in their 34-17 victory. In the nation's capital, it was a battle of the red, white, and blue teams as the New England Free Jacks and Old Glory DC hooked up in a battle between the first and second place teams in the Eastern Conference. But when you have the luxury of having Bodine Walker coming off the bench, last year's MVP, that means trouble for any opponent. A feisty Washington once again fought for 80 minutes but lost to a very formidable Free Jack side. New England continues their sprint to the finish while Old Glory picks up a key bonus point in the loss. Final score, 42 to 24. The team from the Windy City was hosting the team from the Big Apple and it was the hometown Chicago Hounds that kept New York's iron workers on a short leash. Although Rugby New York took the early lead, it was all Chicago for much of the match. Indeed, New York did not get the lead back until the 77th minute and then had to hold their collective breath as Luke Cardi kicked a penalty goal at death that was literally two on target. It hit the post and Chicago fans hit the floor as New York escaped the second city in second place as they earned four key points in the Eastern Conference race. Final score, 21-20. Okay, you need a break, I need a break, and the sponsors need a break. Let's take a break. Need a great price on a new vehicle? Sheehy makes it easy. Easy Price shows you our lowest prices on the Mid-Atlantic's largest selection. Find your best price online or at any of our 31 dealerships. It's easy at Sheehy. Sheehy.com. Hey, you need rugby cleats and you need them tomorrow? Well, rugbynow.com. www.rugbynow.com. If you order them today at 3 p.m. or by 3 p.m. New York time or noon L.A. time, they have youth cleats, male and female. They have adult cleats, male and female. You can have them by tomorrow if you order them today, 3 p.m. New York time, noon L.A. time in the United States. RugbyNow.com. Go off, jam. Hit the ground and go off, jam, jam. Run it, run it, ooh. I really feel it's my time, think it's my year, yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time, think it's my year, yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time, think it's my And we are back with Mr. Mark Winnaker. He now 
of the Miami Sharks, no longer the Toronto Arrows. Mark, welcome to MLR Weekly. Yeah, hey, Matt, great to see you again. So what are we calling you these days? What's your title with the Sharks? CEO. CEO, wow. So you're with the Arrows from its inception or their mm. inception, right? Yeah. You know, even back when they were the Ontario Arrows, if I'm Correct. not mistaken, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And just some background on you. You're initially a Jersey boy, a Jersey <laughs> kid. Moved up to to Canada. Yeah. Initially a Jersey boy, lived in in Canada for 30 odd years. And uh, yeah, transitioning back down to the the lower 49th. All right. So let's let's talk about the Miami Sharks. I know that you're at an airport. Don't worry about it. Uh, We know you're you're busy. You're on the fly, literally. Mm -hmm. And you've you've uh, you told me off camera that your your job is like trying to drink water out of fire hose and you, you accept the fact that you're going to get wet. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we're 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 at the very, very, very early stages. Uh, there's three employees, um, and we're we're all doing a million, million things, and and sometimes simultaneously. So it's every day is a, a different adventure. But we we are seeing day by day, we are seeing progress, and it's starting to pull together, and we're excited. Yeah. So uh, Mariano Marco, who's our COO, Chief Operating Officer, and uh, Jose Pelicina, aka Kochi, who is our head coach. <laughs> Both Argentinian guys. Uh, Mariano lived. He's lived in Florida for some time, so has some local knowledge. And, and coaches like me, he just got there and we're wandering around, lost. So this is really the embry- embryonic stages of this Very franchise. Much, yeah. mm-hmm. You're on. I, you guys are doing well on social media, considering the fact that it's the three of you. You got stuff on <laughs> social media. It's get, you know, there's word getting out there. I've seen articles in different publications. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the ownership group? Yeah, it's uh, the the three principals are are all Arge- wealthy, successful Argentinian guys who who love rugby, who played it, and who are into it, and they're very committed to it and, and very passionate about it. And you know, it's a, it's a you know, I think they don't want to do just what's been done in MLR before. We want to do you know maybe something something past that and, and raise the bar a little bit if we can. Um, there is a you know, an enormous amount of work to be done, but um, everybody seems to be, you know, rolling up their sleeves and doing it. So. And why did they choose Miami? Uh, I think I think they and the league chose Miami because it's it's got this huge, pretty wealthy Argentine community who loves rugby. And so, you know, like every other city, we'll get our 3,000 folks in the stands. It's how do you get the next 7,000? Yeah. And we're, that's the part we're going to, we're going to figure out. But um, you know, it's a vibrant city. There's a lot of there's a lot of money flowing into Miami these days. There's a lot going on. It's exciting. It's got the climate. It's got the facilities, and and it seems like a natural fit. So, we're talking, you know, three thousand to seven thousand. That's like ten thousand. What are we talking about in terms of venue for you? Yeah, we're listen. You know, it's it as you know, in any city and every market's got its challenges. You got to thread the needle between um, where the facility is. How many people it sits? When is it available? How does that fit into the league schedule? How does that fit into the TV schedule? The whole thing. So it's it's pretty complex process. I, I would imagine there's going to be a heavy heavy influence from Argentina on the roster. You know, sure, it's great for us to get some great Argentine players and, and possibly staff, but we need to make this a cosmopolitan team. It can't be just you know all RGs and all North Americans. You can only have you know ten foreigners on the field at the same time. They can't all be RGs. It can't be a divide like that. So you'll see. Yes, you'll see some very good Argentine players, but you'll see some Aussies and Kiwis and English and French and Irish and so on. Well, and we're not. Um, we just want the best guys. And, and what do you say to those people that are moaning about the fact that it's another Sharks franchise in rugby? Not a lot. I mean, there's you know, come on. Any publicity is good publicity. Bro. There's there's sharks. There's the San Jose sharks. There's a million sharks. There's a million lions. There's a million panthers. There's a million tigers. Mustangs. Yeah, you the know, whole I'm animal not, I'm, kingdom has been represented right, over and over. Right, right. I'm not. I'm not too, too concerned about that. All right. So, are you? When are you looking to do exhibition games? I mean, with that, with your non-existent roster right now. Yeah, well, well, we'll get a roster. We've been talking to the league about that and to players and, you know, so on and so forth. We'll kick off, you know, a couple of weeks before the, the season. We're sort of waiting to get a little more clarity on when that's going to start. But we, uh, we, uh, we've we had some good offers from some good overseas clubs. And we've got, we, we've got one or two that, that we're committed to that, that 
do they want to come and play in Miami and we don't have to worry about snow or bubbles or anything like that. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll play at least one, if not two pretty high profile overseas clubs in our preseason. And how are you going to build out the roster? I mean, there's no Giltinis and Austin Gilgronis for you to pillage. Uh, you know, we do have probably, uh, you know, a dozen to two dozen players who are in MLR now who, who are interested in Miami and at their end of their, their term and, and at their team, we have, um, you know, we have confidence that we're going to do a pretty thorough uh, analysis of who is out there. There'll be an expansion draft in, in uh, early August and we'll dip into the college draft a little bit too. And, you know, we'll just listen, we'll, we'll grip it and rip it. We'll make the best out of what we got. Is there a, a, an added amount of money on the salary cap for an expansion team? Not that I know of. I, I did see that rumor that somebody said, "Oh, they don't have they don't have a cap because they're an expansion team." Boy, I wish that were true. That would make things a lot easier. But no, that's yeah. That's money, money cool. helps, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. Now that you're out of the arrows uh, environment, what do you say to those that want the Canadian players marked as international players so that the Canadian players stay in Canada? Well, I think there's a couple of ways to accomplish that. I don't know if you have to mark them as international, but I do, I do feel like, um, you know, Toronto trying to follow the Selkdom model in in Chile is a is a good way to go. And and having Canadian players, you know, rostered in the U.S. who aren't getting game game time, it doesn't really seem to serve either party well. So I I don't know if you make them internationals or you put a cap on them, but I would I would still support that. But what happens when Vancouver, if they, if and when they do come into the league? Well, listen, you know, the, <laughs> sure, uh, but I, I, I don't think that that is a, a, a present opportunity. I think that it's a lot of money. Um, I, I know there's some people in Vancouver passionate about the project, but you know, it, there's there's a lot to this thing, and and uh, I don't think that's an immediate on the horizon thing. Yeah, I, I've spoken to a number of people that have come in when they come into the league after they're in the, the actual amount of money and the hemorrhaging yeah. of cash, they, they kind of right. had an idea about it, but then once you're doing it and you're like, sure. Wow. Right. Well, and then you add a 30% premium on for Canadians because the dollar is worth 75 or 76 right. cents. So you get, a, you know, you got another issue to deal with. So yeah, listen, I, I you know, that that's my personal opinion. I, I, I would still like to see, uh, the Canadians, you know, the Toronto have the, the crack at the Canadians, but, uh, you know, that'll be something on the, the docket for this summer's discussions. Well, the, the, the weird thing for me as, a, as an observer was I thought that that was the direction the team was going in. And then you see like two thirds of the front row playing with New England, you know, and you got Lesage in the back line. And I'm like, that's that's just south of you guys, in essence, in terms of the relative size of the of the MLR's geography your Eastern conference foes. And, and I was, I'm just, I was wondering what that message was from Toronto in terms of, I guess it was just cash. Right. I, I, yeah, it was, there was, there were a number of factors there and it, it's not, you know, it's not my file, so I won't comment on it too much, but I listen, you know, they've turned over some of the older Canadians and brought in some younger Canadians who, and some of the, the young guys, the 20, 21 year olds that, that we've seen on the pitch this year have been pretty good. So you know, yeah. I, I think that's just a natural evolution. What's the what's the Sharks uh, team going to be like? What's is there a, is there a specific uh, type of style that you want to play, or is that way too early right now? I, well, it's early, but I do think that you know, and then the venues that we're talking to have have you know pretty decent sized pitches. So I think that um, we're going to try and play with some flair. You know, it's a it's a it's a city with flair, and and we're going to try and play with some flair. I don't think we're we're looking at bash and crash rugby. Obviously, you know, hor- courses for horses, but you know, I think our goal is to to move the ball, move the ball wide, and play entertaining rugby that the fans can get behind and that reflect the the, the vibe of the city. Well, I am really looking forward to coming down there and calling all your games. <laughs> so just I'm uh, sure you are. Yeah. Just have the sunblock and the Factor Fifty ready for me when I get well, down. Well, we're gonna try and play in the evenings to to cut down on that. But yeah, we'd love to see you. All right. Well, Mark Winokur, I want to thank you and congratulations on the new gig. Thank you, Matt. Look forward to talking to you again. All right, we'll be right back. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig & Whistle, on West 36th Street.
This is the Rugby Odds, where an unlikely pundit panel of a wordsmith, a WWE legend, a rugby star, and a supermodel scour the globe, seeking best bets and bad behavior. Are you not entertained? with Mr. Brian Ray. Brian, welcome back to MLR Weekly. Oh, it's great to be back after the end of the Toronto Arrows losing streak. Something to celebrate. It is, is a tie the end of a losing? I, I guess it's an uh, end of a losing streak, but... I didn't lose. All right. Okay. Now, the first one, Rugby ATL hosting the Jackals. Yeah, ATL's, uh, you know, team management is going to be seething after letting those two points, uh, you know, vital competition points slip against the Arrows, uh, you know, uh, although, you know, they're going to also be concerned about uh, Johan Momsen, who went off at halftime, was holding his arm, did not look good, not a great sign for them if he's hurt, but they, they do have some second rows they can call on, so, that, you know, they'll be okay. Uh, Dallas, you know, <laughs> they had a... Uh, uh, they looked like they were down and out against Utah pretty damn quickly. I mean, <laughs> Connor McLeod had a hat trick in about 15 minutes in that game. But they came back. They made a game of it to their credit. Those guys did not quit. Uh, they're not going to be an easy out for ATL. And, you know, the, the styles kind of, you know, are, are fairly similar. They both play, uh, you know, similar up front. They, they're forward heavy uh, approaches. So, you know, this is another one that ATL has got to be cautious. I'm going to go with Atlanta at home because they have to win this game. They have to get those points. Uh, but, uh, geez, they put themselves in a difficult position. All right, then you've got the Utah Warriors hosting the Houston Sabercats, and suddenly they have the same record. Yeah, and this is a massive game, isn't it? Uh, you know, not many points. How many heading into this weekend uh, separating the two? Uh, just looking, yeah, like three points. So uh, this might be the one that decides that final spot, right? I mean, we, we said that heading into the Seattle game, that that might decide the second or Well, Seattle won that, uh, you know, fairly convincingly in the end after what should have been, you know, it was certainly looking like a very strong win for the Sabercats. They completely bottled in the last half hour of that game. They won't be happy with that. But now they got to win on the road. Oh, if Utah wins, wow. All of a sudden, the tables have turned, haven't they? So this is going to be a really tough match. Really looking forward to this one. Utah looked great in the first half against Dallas. Kind of went to sleep. Going to expect more from them at home. I'm really looking forward to this game. Uh, this is kind of the, the, the one for the, for the weekend that I have my eyes on. Tough call. I don't know who to pick. Yeah. Um, Jeez, uh, you know, in a clash of styles as well. Utah plays wide. Houston likes to play that tactical pressure game. You know what? I'm going to go with Utah in this one. Ooh. Last week, I, I probably would have said Houston, but I'm really disappointed in that showing. So uh, they yeah. had, I'm going to go with Utah at home. I think this is going to be a great game, though. Yeah, but I think you might be missing in the equation here is this is that Seattle is a very good team and they are proving that doesn't matter where they play. They are a very good team. So that segues into the Seawolves back at home at Starfire versus the Chicago Hounds, which if you're a Chicago fan, you, you just got to be devastated and i know that you're you're sitting outside in the parking lot it's your purgatory yeah i mean I've just been sitting here kind of wondering what if that post was just a few inches to the other way uh, luke cardi oh just uh oh, so unlucky in that game and you know you'd have to say chicago probably deserved that one i thought they were the better team to be honest and new york got a little bit lucky in the end they got some oh, you think leadership. Yeah, Sam Windsor coming in and maybe inspiring them a little bit. But 
uh, you know, geez, Seattle, uh, you know, the thing that impresses me is they didn't have their captain and they came back from that after, I mean, they were nowhere for 50 minutes, completely dominated, dominated by Houston and to come back the way they did score 31 un unanswered points in that one that showed a lot of character to me. So like I said, uh, I probably underestimated the Seawolves a little bit in that game and certainly not in this one uh, at home. Uh, you know, riding high after that victory, you got to pick them uh, to win this one. But you know, Chicago are looking a little bit better now. Uh, you know, they just they're close. They're getting there. I just don't think this is going to be their week. And a shout out to Release the Hounds, their 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 fan group, because they are staying with it, and they're building slowly and surely. They get they'll get they'll get some momentum. They'll get it going. But you know, they did play tough, and that's all you can ask. They played hard and they played tough, and they they dominated that match at times. New England. The Free Jacks, your Free Jacks, hosting NOLA in an Eastern Conference battle. And I see that you've got your New York Ironworker shirt on and you've got your Arrows hat. So where is your allegiance here? No New England Free Jacks paraphernalia on this week. Where's your NOLA gold tattoo? Well, well, no, we're working on that one. Just waiting to set an appointment there. I'll let Fitz know when that one comes through. <laughs> um, this is kind of a thing with Nola. You, you write them off and somehow they lift their game. I wish they would do that when we expected them to win. Um, yeah. Now the question is, are, are they going to bring some of these, bat try and get some of these battered bodies in for this game? Or do they say, look, we've got another bye week coming up right after this. And we've got the three games after that we have to win anyways. Maybe we should just target those three and not, you know, anyone borderline not risk them. So I think that's probably the call to make New England at home. They're so they're such a good team right now. I mean, that was a, a, a pretty good old glory team that they put to the sword. So uh, Bowdoin Waka, you know, maybe he'll start this game. You know, they got 10 minutes near the end. Uh, I just think New England has too much firepower, too much class right now to lose to NOLA. And from what I gather, Waka is going to stay there a while. Sign the yeah. extension, right? Yeah, he signed a uh, yeah, I guess a three or two and a half year deal. Anyways, rest of the season and two more on top of that. So, fantastic news for Free Jacks fans. All right, Brian, what thoughts overall? Yeah, we're getting down to the, the nitty gritty now, aren't we? I mean, four games left for some of these teams, uh, you know, and the, we we thought the margins would be very slim coming into this campaign. They are proving out to be just that. I mean, there's no way you can. You know, predict what's going to happen in the next few. I think at this stage, with New England and San Diego are the top two teams. But after that, it's still a race to the finish line. So very much looking forward to uh, the rest of the season. We've got a whole lot to, and hopefully some more surprises. But I think these arrows might have a say in their spoiler role uh, to come yet. So uh, lots of exciting uh, action to come in the next few weeks. Well, you, you you know you really you have to tip your cap to the arrows and even the hounds because they're out of it. And they're still playing hard. They are still playing hard. And, you know, your Toronto fans got to see an exciting rugby game. Really, I mean, 34-34, 68 points. Come on, that's pretty good. And, you know, you mentioned Chicago, but also Dallas. They're not lying down for anybody. They've had some near misses this season. So they could very much play a spoilers role as well down the stretch. Yeah, tense few weeks ahead. Tense few weeks, and we're loving it. We're absolutely loving it. On that note, we're out of time. I want to thank Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. I want to thank Mr. John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning. And I want to thank Mr. Mark Winokur, the CEO of the new Miami Sharks. And thank you for tuning in. Please check out our other shows, including The Rugby Odds with WWE legend John Bradshaw Layfield, the college rugby wrap-up. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Please sign up for our weekly newsletter. And please join our American Red Cross blood donor team. <laughs>